Is it true that these people are really interested in what the Bible has to say and that the Bible is what led them to this decision? This, does the Bible lead a person, a Jewish person, to believe in Jesus? So the real answer to that is no. There's no Jewish believer in Jesus that I know, that I've ever met or heard of, that has ever accepted Christianity because of the Bible, that has embraced Christianity because of the Bible. How do I know this? If you go to any of these people who have converted, and you go to them about a week before they convert, and you say, have you put them to fill in today? They'll tell you, tefillin? Why should I put on tefillin? And you open up the Shema and you say, look, it says, you should bind them on your hand, etc. They'll say, I don't care. I really don't care what the Torah says. A week before you converted, is it true that you tried to use the Torah as your guide in how to live your life? And the answer is no. The answer is no. So what happens? What happens is that after they've made this decision, after they've found Jesus, now what happens is the Bible becomes important. And then they go back to the Bible to try and support this belief that they have. It's much like a drunk uses a lamppost. It's not so much for illumination, but it's for support. They don't go back to the Bible to teach them about their belief, but they go back to the Bible as a support for what they already believe. There was once a man walking through the forest, and he sees in the forest a tree. And on the tree there's painted this huge bullseye, and dead center in it, there's an arrow. He's like, wow, the person who shot that is pretty good. He goes a couple meters down and he sees another guy, another tree, with a, an arrow exactly in the center of the bullseye. Keeps going, 10 meters down, again, the same thing. And he keeps going, keeps going, finally he sees a guy with a bow and a quiver, and he says, did you shoot those? So he says, yes, I did. He says, that's amazing. I've never seen anything so amazing in my life. I've never seen anybody shoot so many arrows and get every single time dead center in the middle. So the shooter says, it's actually not that amazing. He says, you see, what I do is I shoot the arrow, and then what I do is I paint the circle around it. And that's how I get dead center in the middle, okay? The missionaries do the same thing, is that they shoot their arrow. Jesus is the Messiah. Once I already believe that, now what I do is I go back into the Bible. And I do one of two things. Either I go to a passage in the, in the Tanakh, which clearly talks about the Mashiach. And when I say it clearly talks about the Mashiach, what I mean is that this is a posuk, this is a passage in the Tanakh, where both Jews and Christians agree that this is talking about the future king that is going to rule in the Messianic age. So an example of that is Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11, it says, for example, the Nacha Allah Ruach Hashem, the Spirit of Hashem will rest upon him. Right? So they say, who is this passage talking about? Who's this passage talking about? That the Spirit of Hashem will be resting upon him. So, who do you think they say? Jesus. Why? Because they believe that he was the Mashiach. And if this passage is about the Mashiach, it has to be about Jesus because he's the Mashiach. You understand how they shoot the arrow first? But how would you know, how would you know that this passage is actually talking about Jesus? There's no way of verifying that he had the spirit of Hashem any more so than anybody else. It's just a claim, right? Another way they, would, they go about it is that they go through the Tanakh and they try to find things which resemble the life of Jesus. So, we know that Jesus 
was betrayed by a close friend. Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus. Judas Iscariot is the guy who betrays Jesus to the high priest and to the authorities and they come to arrest him, Jewish, they, guy? Jewish guy, one of his apostles. He comes, they come, they arrest Jesus, they take him off, they take him to a trial, then they crucify him. Okay, so Jesus was betrayed by a close friend. So they go to the, they go to the Tanakh and they actually find in Tehillim, in chapter 41, where it says that even my bosom friend who's who ate bread with me has lifted his heel against me, which means that I was betrayed by a close friend. Now, what in the whole chapter of Psalm 41 tells you that this is talking about Mashiach? Absolutely nothing. There's not a hint in there that this is talking about Mashiach. However, being that Jesus was betrayed, and Jesus is the Messiah, Therefore, if Psalm 41 talks about somebody being betrayed, it must be a messianic prophecy. Right? Understand? Mm -hmm. that's, very so, that's circular reasoning. First example. When you come into a court of law, if you bring in boxes and boxes and boxes of evidence, it's bound to overwhelm the jury and the defendant. Because if you have so much evidence, psychologically, the person assumes that this is a really good case. So if a Christian comes over to a Jew and says to the Jew, there are over 300 prophecies which predict precisely and clearly the messiahship of Jesus, the Jew can very easily be intimidated and say, wow. Over 300 prophecies? I mean, I could knock off one or two or three, but 300? I mean, how am I going to knock off 300? That's a very impressive case. However, 300 times zero is still zero, which means that if you're going to give me a passage which has got nothing to do with the Messiah and which can be applied to anybody, that doesn't make a good case in proving that someone's the Messiah. So, if I ask everybody here, who feels that they've been betrayed by a close friend? I'm sure every single one of you here feel that at some point in your life, you were betrayed by a very close friend. So therefore, this psalm could be speaking about you. Why does it have to be speaking about Jesus? So if the proof is so flimsy, Hooking together a whole bunch of flimsy proofs, which are not proofs at all, doesn't make it any stronger.